Here's what the scripture says. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another. And all the more. Hallelujah. As you see the day drawing near. God's help. For the next few minutes, I want to preach to you on this subject. Better together. We are better when we're together. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to call out to God. And I want you to pray that God will help us today. Lord, we love you. You are clearly here by the power of your spirit. Pray, God, that you move in us by your holy word. Touch us, we pray, Lord, by the Holy Ghost. Cause us, Lord, to receive, Lord, your word with open hearts and cause your power to confirm the reliability and trustworthiness of the word at the end of this message. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. You may be seated. For nine and a half chapters, the author of Hebrews has made a robust defense that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. He's better than the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is better than the angels. He is better than Moses, Aaron, and Joshua. In fact, compared to the Old Testament, the covenant that Jesus brings is better. Jesus is the fulfillment of every Old Testament story, of every Old Testament hero, of every Old Testament ritual. It can all be found and summed up in Jesus. Anything that you find within the pages of the Old Testament that is deep, that is meaningful, that is heroic, it is a mere symbol or sign or picture of the one who is to come, who is none other than the God of glory. Jesus is better. In fact when you read the stories of the heroes of the Old Testament whenever you see people of God doing great and mighty things, that we're not looking at us. When I see David, I'm not looking at me. When I see Moses holding the rod over the Red Sea, I'm not looking at me. What I'm seeing is Jesus Christ standing between doom and God's people and bringing hope and deliverance. In fact without Jesus the faith of the Old Testament heroes would be incomplete. Jesus is better. He gives us a better hope. He gives us better promises. He gives us a better sacrifice for sin. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus, pick your prophet. Jesus is better. Pick your favorite religious ritual. Jesus is better. Pick your favorite Bible character. Jesus is better. What sacrifice in the world could you ever bring for sin? What attempts could you ever make to absolve yourself of your flaws, of your faults, of your failures? How many times you after falling, you get up and you make promises to God. I'll try harder next time. I'll do better next time. I'll do this. I'll do that. If you get me out of this I promise I will make it up to you God I want to let you know Jesus is better than all those things you could ever there is no sacrifice there is no good deeds there are no good words that you could ever bring that could compare to the blood and the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ in fact Hebrews says when Jesus offered himself up once for our sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. Now I've heard my whole life that when the priests would offer in the temple, they would never sit down because the work was never done. 
It would be one sacrifice after another, one lamb after another, one turtle dove after another, one goat after another. And they never were allowed to sit because the work was always done because there would never be enough blood shed on that brazen altar to absolve the sins of the children of Israel, let alone the whole world. But when Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, he ascended up into heaven and he sat down on his throne because the work was finished. That's all it took for the entire world to have a way of redemption. His blood was so precious. His sacrifice so pure. His life so perfect that the blood that he shed was enough for the whole world. No wonder the old timer said, take this whole world. Give me Jesus. Take this whole world. Give me Jesus. Jesus is better. Why don't you clap your hands to the Lord if you believe that right now. (laughs) Praise God. He's better. So what is the response then that we should have to this better everything that Jesus provides? What should we do in response to a covenant and to a God like this. Thankfully, the text tells us. and We read it. He said in the preceding verse, let us hold fast to our confession. That's the first thing he said. He said, hold fast to Jesus. Never let go of Jesus. Don't go back to something inferior. And I know you've heard this message a million times from a, this, across this pulpit. But we have to hold on to this precious truth of the oneness of God and the new birth and the life of consecration that we live as followers of Jesus. We've got to hold. There is no room in the world that we live in where everyone is trying to find their own path and their own personal truth and doing what is right in their own eyes. No, no, no. Not this church. Not the apostolic church. We have got to hold fast to our confession. Not that Jesus Jesus is a way, but that he is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. And there's no way that you can live a good life, let alone get to heaven, unless you come by way of the cross and you bow your knee in repentance. You're water baptized in the name of Jesus and you're filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. Never let it go, he says. He says, hold fast to this truth. But then he says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. That's the response. Hold fast to the confession of our faith. Hold fast to the precious truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hold fast to the conviction. And then consider... One another. See, the Jewish Christians that lived during the time that this book was offered were being tempted to go back to their old life. They were being tempted to return to the rituals, the safety of the rituals that came with the practice of the Jewish faith. And so they were being tempted to look out for flaws in this church, to look out for failures in the church. To look for weaknesses in the teaching. To poke holes in the doctrine and in the practices and the body. They were looking for what was wrong. They were looking for what was flawed. They were trying to find all of the mistakes. And the author is saying, Jesus is better. So with one hand, hold fast to the doctrine. And with another hand, hold fast to your brother and sister. Stop trying to find what is wrong. Stop trying to look for what is wrong with everyone and in everything. But in response to Jesus, let us consider one another. Fellowship with God must never become a selfish endeavor. 
We all come to God in a crisis. That's just how it is. Nobody wakes up pondering this, the nature of the universe and the philosophy of man is like, hey, I think I want to go to the church where they run around, fall on the ground, and they talk in funny words. They just don't. Everybody I've ever won to God or anybody that's ever been won to God in our church has come in moments of crisis. They come in moments of brokenness. They come in moments of tremendous need. And they need Jesus to fix them and save them and rescue them. But at some point in your walk with God, you've got to transition from considering yourself and your own needs to thinking about others more than you think about yourself. Because Jesus is better. Think about people besides yourself. Consider people and pay attention to others. This cannot, and I know the past 18 months has absolutely been disruptive to our walks with God and our way of life. But can I tell you, we must fight to make this path of discipleship never a solo journey. Living for Jesus is never about just me and mine and my kids and my family. It always includes the whole body. And so he says, think about one another and provoke them to love and good works he uses a potentially negative word provoke means to poke to poke with a stick to irritate to get under the skin he says if you're going to get anybody under anybody's skin in this house let it be for love and good works He flips the meaning of the word on its head, not to irritate, but to spark love and to spark compassion. And in a world where we're all facing temptations to abandon Jesus, who is better, we've got to maintain the discipline of motivating each other to love and good works. And the best way to spark acts of love and good works is by example. It's not to say when I get my needs met then I will begin to worry and concern about the needs of others. It's saying no I'm going to pour myself into people and I am going to love people and I am going to open up my I love and I'm going to open up my life to people and I'm going to try to stir one another not so they can do something good for me but so that I can do something good for them and in the process of serving and loving people you will find your own needs being met we must live in such a way that other people begin to want to say how they treated me I want to treat them by the way they treated me I want to treat my family. They made me feel special. They made me feel good. They made me feel a part. And so I want to reach out to somebody else and do for them what they've done for me. Look at what the scripture says about this. Ephesians 4, 2 through 3. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults. The Bible just assumes there's going to be drama. It's just like, here's what you need to do. People be crazy. So make allowance for their crazy because of your love. And then he says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, building yourselves together with peace. We are fragmented as a society. Canadian culture is fragmented. Our politeness and niceness has been shattered and shown to be somewhat of a myth as people are divided across every kind of line that you can imagine. Ethnicity, language, color of skin, demographics, this, that, you name it. You name the world is divided and this means it's going to be hard to live in unity. So the the, the apostle says, make every effort, whatever you've got to do to stay unified with your brother or your sister and love them, you do it. 
Let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The King James says, So much the more as you see the day approaching. And let me tell you how I have preached this verse. And it's not wrong to preach it like this. I have said, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. And then I've skipped right over the next line. And I said, and so much more as you see the day approaching. All the more as you see the day approaching. And the Holy Spirit checked me in prayer one day as I was reading through the book of Hebrews. And he wanted me to go back I can read this verse again and the Holy Ghost pointed me to the text and said if you'll read that plainly you will see the so much the more or the all the more is not just about attendance to gatherings it is also about encouragement in fact I would argue that that all the more has more to do with the practice of encouragement than it does anything else because one of the most visible signs of a fall follower of Jesus is frequent gatherings in you know together in the church but also mutual encouragement I would preach this this morning as much as you value coming to the house of the Lord with your family and worshiping we must also value encouraging one another building one another up and showing love as much As we celebrate faithfulness, we need to celebrate encouragement. As much as we celebrate attendance, we must celebrate brotherly love in the body of Christ. And the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, and He's coming very, very soon, we need to be ever more faithful to being with one another, hearing the Word, worshiping together. This is not the time to stay home. This is not the time to bail out on the church. Neither is it the time to be a complainer or a fault finder or to worry only about you and yours and your family. But so much the more, we've got to build one another up. We've got to encourage one another. One of the greatest needs of our day is for love and encouragement. Our world is broken. My wife works in healthcare and she works with a VP of HR for five hospitals in the city of Hamilton. And one of them is a two million square foot women and children's hospital. And she was talking with some surgeons and some doctors there. They were saying, we're not doing surgeries. Pediatric surgeons, obstetricians, and they're saying, we're not, we're not delivering babies. We're psychiatrists now because our wards are so full of children. We're sending them to adult psychiatric institutions. Hear me, our world is broken. Sin has not been kind. The world has not been kind. Family relationships have imploded. Opioid overdoses have increased in the past two years in manifold numbers. In my church downtown, as I walk into worship on Sundays, our parking lot is littered with needles for those who are addicts that have have shot up and left their needles the night before, in the middle of the night. Poverty and depression and anxiety and abuse. Life has a way of breaking you down. Life has a way of robbing you of your confidence. Life has a way of making you feel worthless. And there are people, maybe even in this room, where thoughts of failure and self-loathing swirl in your head and there's a voice that's telling you I can't make it I can't do this I'm not like these other people even if you come from a good family even if you've been serving God for a long time trials and troubles of life can knock you to the ground the great revivalist Billy Cole said this most people don't die for a lack of rebuke most people don't die because they are too proud. But the, the minefield or the battlefield of the Christian life is littered with the corpses of dead walks with God of people who have died for a lack of encouragement. 
And us Canadians, we tend to be a little self-deprecating. And we, you know, we're like, we don't want to say too much, eh? We don't want them to get a big head or nothing, right? You know, boys, if you say too many good things, you never know. You have to carry his head in with a friend into church. That's not the struggle. Can I just be real with you? That's not the struggle right now. The great struggle for so many is not that they need help carrying in their ego into the house of God, but that they're plagued with fear. <laughs> They're plagued with brokenness. And what's holding them back from consecrating their heart fully to Jesus is that they wake up every day not with feelings of superiority but with the voice of an enemy telling them that they cannot make it. This is why Ephesians 4, 29 through 32 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that you may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. How do we grieve the Holy Ghost? By how we treat people. We don't grieve the Holy Ghost through a series of complicated things. But Jesus, in the context of this verse, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God when we refuse to build one another up. That's why the next verse says that all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice and be kind to one another. Tender hearted easily moved easily moved with compassion towards people forgiving one another as God has forgiven you. My friend Luke said it like this. God didn't call you to fix people so they don't get proud. God didn't call you to point out everyone's flaws. But he did call you to love and encourage. You have amazing pastors in this church. You let them. And I, I know I'm being plain and direct right now. I hope this is all right. But you have incredible men and women of God that lead this assembly. You let them rebuke. You let them reprove. You let them correct those that are new or that are struggling. But the rest of us, let's just come alongside and let's love and encourage and build up. Let's be kind and tenderhearted to one another. You may be saying, well, that's not who I am. I just tell it like it is. And that's just who I am. Well, change who you are. I'm glad we all have changed by the power of the Holy Ghost. What we got to do is we got to take every critical and fault-finding and prickly part of us to an altar and say, Jesus, you purge this out of my spirit because you've called me to be an encourager. You've called me to build up. You've called me to show love called to be tender hearted it's important to understand that whenever and I'm not saying this because I believe anything to be true but I'm just saying that when we are passing judgment that Jesus loves the person that we are judging just as much as he loves us there's nobody special in the eyes of Jesus the love of Jesus is the great equalizer amongst all people hallelujah and when we encourage someone and when we choose to build them up, you can change someone's life with the love that you show. You can change someone's life with your encouragement. You can change someone's life with your exhortation. I fell down the rabbit hole of the science of encouragement a few days ago. And I found out that they have done brain scans on this. And I was like, that's cool. I like to nerd out. Let's read this. And there was a large study that they did where they did brain scans on people before performing a task that required memory and concentration. In other words, they showed you flashcards and saw if you remembered it or you had to identify something with increasing speed. And they had two rooms. They had the complimenting room and then they had the insult room. And to make it fair, they gave both the compliments and the insults in like the Siri or Google Assistant voice. And this is literally what they did. They'd bring people in like this dark scientific laboratory and sit them in front of a screen. And then if you 
for the unlucky individual to get tossed into the insult room. He'd sit down in the chair and you'd hear things like, you're going to fail. Loser. And then you get an answer wrong. Told you so. <laughs> you know, like the turn right here, it'd be like, you might as well quit now. And then in the next room, they sat people down. And the Siri voice kicked in. But instead it said, you're going to do a great job. And every time they got an answer right, fantastic. I believe in you. And here's what they discovered. That people who were complimented by the robot voice not only felt better, but they did better. They performed better. In other words, encouragement made them sharper. But in the insult box, in the insult room, the negative insults pushed aside this executive center, the prefrontal cortex in the brain, and, and the amygdala would take over. And you're like, what's the amygdala? It's the monkey brain part of you. It's the fight or flight. It's the part of you that stops thinking critically and starts thinking either in anger, rage, or fear, fight or flight. So instead of creative thinking, cognitive flexibility, information processing, you prepare for crisis. Crisis. It's the knee-jerk response to stress. You get scared. And when you get scared, you don't think clearly. You don't coordinate well. You don't come up with new ideas. And you retreat to the old way that you would deal with problems. But when somebody treats you with kindness, it encourages you. And it can help you think more clearly. And that is the summary of the study. And if encouragement like this can make a difference with flashcards, in a laboratory no matter what kind of voice it comes from imagine with me this morning when it comes from a saint of God like you that's full of the Holy Ghost that's full of the power of God if a guy in a lab coat can impact so, someone so much that the way their brain functions can change while sitting in a desk, so much more will you clothe in the anointing of God, walking in the power of the Spirit, walking in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. How much more difference can you make when you lay hands on somebody and pray for them? How much of a difference can you make when you meet them in the foyer and you you say, I believe in you. I trust you. You're going to make it. Heaven will be your home. Don't you worry about a thing. Hallelujah. God is in control. How much more when you pick up the phone call and you wish another member of this church a happy birthday or a happy anniversary and you say life is better because of you. The church is better because of you. If a robot voice can help people remember better, how much more will a saint of God make an impact on a new Christian? I dare say we won't help them remember more Bible verses, but we'll point them on the road that leads to everlasting life. We are better together. We are better together. We are better when we love one another. You can move someone from fear to faith. You can move someone from worry to worship. You can move someone in one moment, one conversation, one phone call. And move someone from defeat to victory. And move someone from sorrow to rejoicing. That's what we can do in the body of Christ. So how can we do that, Pastor Adam? How can we be that kind of exhorting and encouraging people? I'm going to give you a few things. Number one, and this is the easiest, we worship together. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. When we worship, when we praise, when you lifted your hands like you were doing as this worship team was singing, and you clapped to the song, and when the song was done, you led a chorus of hallelujahs. 
I praise you, Jesus. You're so good to me, God. What you're doing is offering more than Pentecostal ritual to Jesus at the end of a song led by the team. What you are doing is creating an atmosphere of encouragement and exhortation. You may have come into church today feeling really good about your life, but somebody on the other side of the room, maybe they're in trouble. Maybe, maybe their marriage is in trouble. Maybe their children are in trouble. Maybe they're having negotiations with the lawyer as to whether or not they're going to stay together. Maybe their child is thinking about leaving the church. Maybe they're getting ready to go for a bone scan or a CT scan for an awful disease and they haven't told anybody about it yet because they're terrified. But as you begin to praise God, all of a sudden fear can give way to faith. All of a sudden worry can give way to love. And people can, even though you haven't said a word to them personally, by creating an atmosphere, all of a sudden they believe, I can make it. I can follow God. This marriage can last. My children will come home. And God can heal me. Praying for one another. We pray for one another. We fellowship with one another. One of the great tragedies of all of this stuff that we have been going through is it has disrupted our ability for fellowship. But the moment you can safely do so in any way that makes you feel comfortable, you need to start because people are in need of fellowship with one another. And then the most important way is actual words of encouragement. Romans 12.10 says... Let us love one another with brotherly affection. Let us outdo one another in showing honor. People hear enough negative words. The world is full of mockery. We mock everything. Gossip, put downs. Social media is rife with the negativity. People already have the voice of the devil condemning them for their failures. What they need from the church is words of encouragement. He said, outdo one another in showing honor. If there's to be any competition in the body of Christ, let it be for the showing of honor and the showing of love. You want to know what? Sometimes what can happen is when we get in crisis moments ourselves, like the one we've been in as a nation and as a church for 18 months, there can be a desire to look out for yourself, to look out for what your greatest needs are, to look out for the things that are putting pressure on your life. But instead, in the church, let's look out for one another. Instead of trying to be seen, let's celebrate and lift up one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's outdo one another in the showing of love and in the showing of honor. Practice uplifting people with your words. I'm getting ready to come to a close. Say things like, I believe in you. I love you. Even if that's not part of your ordinary vernacular, it's not part of mine. But I have made up my mind over the past several years. I'm going to tell people that I love them. I'm going to tell people that I believe in them. I'm going to tell people that they're special. I'm going to tell them that God's got plans for you. They may be a mess. Their life may be a wreck. They may be the furthest that a person can be from serving in any sort of leadership or ministry in the church but I've made up my mind let's speak to the potential let's speak to what Jesus let's show people what they can be in Jesus they may not be there yet they got stuff they got to work on but that's okay I'm going to tell them who they can be in Jesus I'm going to tell them who they are in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ I love you I believe in you I appreciate you walk up to the music team and say thank you for leading us in worship Tell the musicians, I love the way you play. Tell the usher, thank you for holding that door. Tell somebody, thank you for being kind to me. Find whoever put sand on the, on the, in the foyer or in the parking lot and say, thank you so very much. Let's outdo one another in the showing of honor. Let's encourage one another. I didn't send you a photo came to me right before I walked up 
But where I've seen this is in the life of a young man by the name of Elmer. Elmer left the church when he was 10 years old or 11 years old. That's, that's early. But he had had enough. And he became an alcoholic by the time he was 20 years old. And for the next four years of his life, he drank nearly every day. He would, he would take, by nearly every day, what I mean is that he would take the odd Tuesday afternoon off. You wouldn't know it to look at him. Handsome dude, dressed well, drove an incredible car. But we were in the middle of a small group session. And he walked into his sister's room and he didn't know what was going on. And he said, I, I need to tell you something. I've got to get my life together. I said, what's going on, buddy? We stopped whatever we were doing. Because he became the most important person in the room on that Zoom call. I said, what's going on? I said, last night I got so drunk, I started throwing up, but I couldn't stop. And I started choking. As I, and this is absolutely disgusting, but this is what happens when people are lost in sin. He said, I began to aspirate on my own vomit. And I began to choke to death. And everything started getting black in my peripheral vision. And I started passing out, and I knew, I knew I was about to die. So I called for my mom. His mom's a wonderful woman of prayer in our church. He said, I called for my mom, and I called for my sister. And they rushed into the bathroom, and there's vomit everywhere. And they began to pray and intercede. He said, I passed out. But somehow, instead of dying, I woke up. And I want to let you know, I need, I need God. I need to change. I need something to be different in my life and I don't know what came over me but I said buddy God is going to change you God is going to transform you God is going to turn you into a brand new person I believe God's going to call on your life I believe God's wanting to anoint you for purpose I believe that God didn't let you die because there's people that you're going to save with the story of deliverance that's going to start right now did that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know, Pastor Adam. He was, he was drunk 24 hours early. I know he was drunk and so does he. I know that he was, he was almost dead the night before. But in that moment, uh, what he needed to hear was not condemnation over his sin. But he needed to feel the mercy of God. Where God would not just give him forgiveness, but God would give him hope. We are four months into a Bible study. He's reading his Bible. He's fasting one day a week. He's reading books about apostolic doctrine he's bringing friends to church and he's starting to say you know I want to hang out with you more Adam because God may call me to preach like he called you God may call me into the can you believe that Pastor Adam if God could call me into the ministry here's what happened with Elmer's life it wasn't because of me it wasn't because I'm smart but through the process of a whole church encouraging a young broken man he began to believe that the promises of God he heard about as a nine year old could be true for him and no matter how many times he had failed no matter how broken he was that Jesus had a purpose for his life better together the conclusion of that verse that text we read together as he said exhorting one another encouraging one another so much the more as you see that day approaching. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Are we doing this because we want to be like the positive self-help section in Indigo or Cole's bookstore or chapters? No. 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 No, we're not doing that at all. Are we doing this because of the power of positive thinking? No. No, we're not. We are doing this because one day the trumpet is going to sound. 
and the sky is going to open. And those who are dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so we will ever be with the Lord. We are doing this. We are sending this message. We are encouraging one another because Jesus is coming back and we want everyone to make it. Jesus is the best thing to ever happen to the world. Jesus is better than sin. He's better than evil. He's better than drugs and alcohol. And one day he's going to come back. One day he's going to take his church home. So let's make sure everybody stand with me. Let's make sure everybody, every person, Everyone in this room, when I get to heaven, I want to see you with me. There's not a person in this room that I don't want to see make it to heaven and make it to glory. Are we perfect? No. But we encourage one another because one day the Lord is going to return. And I want everyone to make it because we're better together. We're better when we worship together. We're better when we sing. We're better when we love one another. We're better when we lift one another up. So here's what we're going to do. And I know that there are space restrictions in this altar, but I wonder if we could turn this whole room into a place of response to the Word of God. You're with people in your row. Somebody in your bubble. Let's have no one praying alone. Let's have no one closing out this service by themselves. But let's link up with one another, family with family, bubble with bubble, close one with close one. And let's pray a prayer of blessing and encouragement over one another. We are going to put the Word of God into practice right now. I do not have time to lay hands on every single one in this room, nor would it be wise for me to do so. I don't know every need. I don't know who's sick. I don't know who's struggling. I don't know whose marriage is in trouble. I don't know whose kids are backsliding. I don't know who here has lost a job, but the Spirit of the Lord does. And as we pray for one another, and as we love one another, another and as we encourage each other the spirit of God is going to meet the needs in this house through the prayers of this body so I want you to lift your voice right now and I want you to call out to God as you begin to sing as this worship team sings for us I want you to begin to pray a prayer of blessing Holy Ghost bless them Lord in every way would they prosper in every way would they be strengthened Lord meet the needs of this house we pray